Good evening. It's so wonderful to welcome you all to this new and exciting version of Red Invisible. We're trying it this evening as a hybrid in real life and online event. Um, as you can see, we're outdoors in the public realm in Notting Hill, um, welcoming you to the launch of Joy Gregory's Invisible Life Force of Plants. This is the third commission in the series Breath of Invisible, which was born out of an urgent need to address some of the many issues um, that I think we've all been experiencing over the last three months. Um, and in fact, Aisha, I distinctly remember when you rang me maybe three or four months ago yes. in response to the George Floyd killing, and you were very upset and moved. Um, so I think um, it's been a very uncertain time globally for people of us. And, um, the week that was happening with the pandemic and COVID, I think we were all feeling very restless and going inwards and really introspection as to what really mattered in life. And then we were met with the incident of George Floyd that really um, upset me and I think a number of friends and colleagues. And I felt a need to enforce a dialogue in the local community where we lived to ensure that people were engaging um, with, um, with a dialogue that was much needed. I think there was um, there was this sort of fear around individuals to express how they felt, and the most prominent way to bring about that dialogue not seem like the most um, apparent way that we could do that. And what better way to have um, a dialogue enforced, um, um, you know, by having a public art exhibition which is democratic, which is on the facade of a building where each individual over the last three months, with each exhibition that we've had, starting with Khadija Sae and then. Um, you know, Zachary Eastwood Bloom of Martin Ware, now Joy Gregory, coming in um, and taking away their own personal experience, feeling an emotion inside of them, which um, can trigger so many emotions in many ways. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been a hell of a journey, and we've been really, really moved by the response of the local community. In fact, it was really, really important to both of us, I think, from the start, when we started talking about this, to make sure that we didn't just sort of jump in that we didn't just come in in a, in a way that didn't feel natural. And I'm afraid it's a lovely London red bus uh, passing by, so excuse us. It's one of the many joys of doing an outdoor, an outdoor art exhibition. Um, but obviously it's very important that we start site, site specificity. So we thought very much about where the site was. We thought about the history of the community. We thought about the fact that Nottingham Carnival wasn't happening this year. We thought about the Windrush generation. We looked around us and obviously we're in a very green and leafy area. So all these sorts of things came into play, but we thought it didn't mean anything unless we actually engaged with, talked to, celebrated, and raised money and support for local community organizations. So every single project we partnered with a community organization. And with this iteration of Red Invisible, the Invisible Life of Plants, we partnered with the Harrods now, why is that important to you? You know, one thing is to artists to come about and display their works and provoke an emotion with an individual who is experiencing their work. But I think to engage the local community um, on each project has been very important because it's been the betterment of lives of so many individuals. With Kadita Sae, we have a scholarship program that was launched in conjunction with the launch of her works. Um, with Martin Ware, Zachary, and Bloom, we had young artists who were commissioned to come on board and and you know, um, express how they were feeling. And with um, Joy, it's been incredible how she's been working with children in the local community and teach them how to um, uh, do printing and work with plants. And it's given them um, something to do over the summer months when in fact they would have had nothing to do if it hadn't been for her. Well, on that note, let's go and um, welcome Joy. I think she's just arrived. Nice to be here. She distinctly remember I met Joy online, um, virtually, not in real life, at a South London Gallery patrons tour, talking about how actually we're dealing with COVID and a pandemic and those strange and uncomfortable and disturbing feelings that we all have. It was a very strange time. I think it's even more strange than it is now, although we felt like we're going in and out of things. Um, and my whole way of being is around having some form of structure. And so one of the things I, I did in order to make sure that I actually did something every day 
because I used to go to the local park for walk. Um, and I'd walk for an hour and a half to the beach or something. <laughs> um, and first of all, I just did a walk and then I took photos. And then I started bringing um, plants back. Because, like each day I would bring in one different plant. So it became like a, a diary. It's almost like a, a botanical diary of, of how you felt and what you saw on your travels. Yeah. And I think you mentioned to me that when you were actually climbing these plants and then it, you decided to take photographs of them using a Victorian photographic process. And that was quite important in itself, wasn't it? Well, yeah, the way in which I recorded them. Um, so I didn't actually take photographs per se, but I made photographs that used the plants to actually make those photographs of the sun. So it was like going back to the um, very beginnings of photography. So um, I, I worked with um, some photographic paper that I had lying around the studio, um, which was like black and white papers. So it's normally a beautiful one um, with the enlarger and pics and everything. So I decided that I wouldn't want to do was use it to record the time. But one of the things I actually noticed with the, with the, the pictures of the response of the paper was the plant would sort of like leave its breath on the paper in the form of an umbrella. Um, and the colours would sort of like these quite um, intense colours and they would change. They would change from being yellow to, to blue um, through to, to the colours that you can see here, um, depending on the time that it was out in the sun. Um, and we had some really good sunny days. We didn't actually really need sun, so some of them were done under the window. But there is almost this sort of aura, this life force around them. And I think that, that idea of breath is something that's kind of pervaded through the whole series and how we feel about that. Um, Joy, I know that you've actually, this is not new for you, you've actually, over the last 10 years, this is something that's you know, been a passion that you've been researching plants and economic botany. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, like I've, I mean, I've always been around plants from, since growing up. My parents had a garden and they also had allotments later and could like grow their own food and everything. But um, my, I went with my parents to Jamaica because I'd never ever been before in the, in the early 90s, like 92 or something. And I was suddenly struck by the fact that you know, like they came from this very rural area full of plants. And I came back and I was doing a project which was actually about something completely different, but I met um, someone at the Natural History Museum who introduced me to the Sloan Collection, Sloan Herbarium, and I realised that a lot of the plants with which um, I am familiar, which we all are familiar, um, were part of something called the Columbus Exchange, and so they sort of like, you know, some plants came here and some plants um, went there from here and, and obviously diseases went there. So it was quite interesting thinking about that in terms of the Yeah, I think early on when we were speaking today, we talked a bit about the idea of bioprospecting, which is something that you hear a lot in terms of sort of Silicon Valley startups. But of course that's actually not new. Um, food has obviously been bought by explorers back from everywhere with prospectors to use for food, nourishment, medicine and even love potions. But I was kind of can you tell us about a couple of the images here Joy? Yeah, I mean, like I suppose this one, this is a, um, this is a, a bitter dock or a dock leaf, which was one of the ones I really um, took to first of all, was because it's like something from my childhood and sort of like remember getting stinging nettles and then sort of like using that to um, secure oh, it. So, think, so thinking about um, plants as medicine as well as food and, that, and that's actually been there. I think one of the most important things about this project for me has been thinking about how important plants are for, for our existence and, and vice versa in, in some respects. Um, so like they feed us to, to do with our um, you know, medicine, but also um, in terms of mental health. And, and I think about my, myself going off to the park and, and those green spaces being so important. I think London's parks have really been a lifeline for so many of us. I think what's going to be wonderful is I've just noticed over the last few days since we installed this, people just coming up and looking at these plants. And I think sometimes actually we've forgotten living in urban areas what these plants are and where they come from. It's actually they're all microbes. Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the plants here in, the, in, in this is by rules and many plants we're um, familiar with. I mean, they, they are di as diasporic as yeah. any city in the modern world. Um, so, you know, you think about the tomato, 
um, which you think, oh, well, that's sort of like something that's very Italian mm -hmm. because it's in the same market. It actually is um, from Mexico. So I think we've got the rocket here. Um, some of the, um, so, like, so we're doing with the rocket. And so I've we zoom in on some of these. Um, I think rocket and that's the holly bulb, the holly bulb, which um, is very typical of so many um, English gardens. I mean, I, if I think about holly bulb, I think about sort of like 1930s, like oh, typical countryside garden. It's actually from Japan, so that's a, a, a migrant to, to here. Um, is there anything else that you think of as quintessentially English that comes from somewhere else? Um, potatoes. We don't think of it as being English, but we do think of them as being Irish. I think they're very Irish. Um, and my, my parents actually you know, refer to um, potatoes, to be, to potatoes here as being Irish potatoes. In Jamaica, they call them Irish potatoes. But they're actually from um, Bermuda and London. I think the London bus is a great time for us to move on to the Zinc Park program. Um, I'm going to see you in five minutes. Um, we're going to be now welcoming Miranda Lowe, who is um, a curator and museum scientist at the Natural History Museum. Um, she and we are going to have a in conversation inside, unpicking some of the uses and histories of plants, Hanslow Herbarium, Kew Gardens, the Millennium, Millennium Seed Bank, um, and also talking about Joy's practice and why it's so important for her to actually engage collaboratively um, with community groups, which is you know, which is core to the way Joy works. Um, but I do encourage you all to come down and experience this work in real life because it's not quite the same. Um, but on that note, we'll, I think we're going to um, switch over now to um, Joy and Miranda inside. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in a the chat box. And at the end of Joy and Miranda's talk, we will try and answer those. Um, but thank you very, very much for joining us today. And thank you for, um, yeah, experiencing and putting up with and um, allowing us to risk this first hybrid in real life and online rather than visible event. Thank you. It's a joy to actually meet you at last. You've given everybody a wonderful preview and an insight into your exhibition just now. But you and I actually have um, a bit of a connection in terms of this whole thing. We do. We do. I mean, like, we've had like 10 years of not managing to meet. <laughs> <laughs> As they say, better late than never. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, because we um, because I was got involved in the Sloan project at the Natural History Museum, British Museum, and um, at British Library. Some I think it was about ten years ago, and um, you know I kept hearing your name and it's like you must get in touch and and, and somehow I think and I think I wrote to you after I spoke to James yeah. Delbargo. He said you must get in touch, <laughs> and then I did actually write, and, um, yeah. event, and then you wrote back. <laughs> I did, I did, because lockdown has been an interesting time, or the pandemic has been an interesting time and challenging time for most of us, but a, a time of reflection, of course, and observing a lot of the nature around us. And um, I, I think um, that might have been part of the inspiration for um, your exhibition. Tell us a little bit more of um, you know, how um, this time has been for you. Um, it's been, I mean, like, I, I think doing this project has actually mm. kept me sane, even though I never actually, when I started, I didn't actually think about it as a project. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes the best work you make actually comes out of just doing, just just getting on and doing things. And and with this, it was really a, a response to sort of like just being, not really just being alive, but just sort of like keeping yourself alive um, and keeping yourself sane, um, or keeping myself sane, not everybody else's self sane. Um, mm by doing something which is almost ritualistic. And I, and when I started off, I was like, I mean, because I have this thing about picking plants. Um, which is like, I, I think somebody told me off once for picking a plant in London because they said it was illegal to pick weeds or something. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're chopping them down, it's like you're not allowed to pick them. So I, at the beginning, because it was quite cool, I mean, like, because March is, was, I mean, like, it was quite cool at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I just remember picking things up and bringing them back to the studio um, and then, you know, putting them into the um, into this into the like a glass frame, and they were quite mm -hmm. small pieces. Um, and and sometimes I pick the same thing up over and over again. But it was um, 
but it was more about keeping the diary. So I'd sort of like identify the plants. So I used this thing called, there's an app called PlantNet, which I've used to identify the plants. And I just think I grew up in the countryside and I realized I actually didn't know the names of a lot of the plants around me, apart from like you know, daisies and dandelions. But there were so many, like you know, blue mallow or something that I was really, and you know, I saw it all the time, but I never actually thought about it as being a thing. In fact, that you know, all of the plants that are um, outside are from you know from London well they're, they're, I, I found them in London but they're from all over the world which is like really not really interesting brings me back to the idea of Sloan in many respects. Yes um, it, because um, Sloan for me obviously I, I work at the Natural History Museum and um, he is the, the founder of, of the British Museum collection but the Natural History collections actually moved from the British Museum and in 1881 um, the Natural History Museum opened in South Kensington and so for me I've been using um, his work, his collections to um, profile and release a lot of hidden narratives around his collection of plants and um, I wonder how it was for you at the first time when you examined the Sloan herbarium itself and sort of looking in detail into the plants that the museum had and then um, you know how that impacted on, on your work that you've produced in terms of this exhibition as well. well I think that the, 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 the Sloan collection and I like because I've been doing this thing around the, around mm. seeds for a long time anyway yeah. but um, with the, the Sloan collection I think to me, it was it was impossible to read that herbarium without looking at his journal, where he documents um, his um, well, I wouldn't call them adventures, but his time in Jamaica, and and also how he casts himself in this um, I don't know in, in in the frame of being the objective person looking at the at the scenes. And I remember one description that he has of. Um, a, a, a black woman who, no, an African woman, who was, you know, full of torpor and misery. Um, and she never spoke, she never did anything. She was just absolutely still um, in a, a corner. And, um, and no matter what medicine you gave her, no matter what you did for her, she wouldn't move. And it was, to me, it was like, well, of course, you know, she's actually really depressed. She's been taken away from her home. She doesn't know where she is. She's in this other, other place. Um, and the way in which he describes plants and the, way, the, the fact that a lot of the plants that are in the herbarium were collected by, um, by slave people and he would actually go and, and talk to them um, in their grounds because like at, at, one, at that one particular period, you know, on Sundays, which is why Sunday is so special, um, you know, people were allowed to just spend time on their own ground, growing their food, which they could then take to market. And, and I think for me, this whole thing of working on this project, working with plants, is it's just so much part of my DNA. It's so much part of my culture. Um, but it's, it's like speaking a language. It's like you don't even think about it. So, so even though I don't know the names of plants, and which is why it was, I, I mean, I've actually really valued that thing in, in lockdown, being able to identify these things which are so familiar to me. But also to when you know sort of like thinking about what they were used for as well and um, and how they um transformed into you know everyday medicine today but also um how you know things that we think of as being from here as you know our food uh, are things that are, are part of a a whole a, a history and a story which started in um, 1493 or 1492 <laughs> and it still has its repercussions today. Yes it does and, and I think um, a, a, another thing we have in common because you say during this time you were collecting the plants and um, things that um, assumed common um, to the UK have actually come from further afield but have become established in this country but during lockdown my own experience was again was looking at at the plants, the common plants, the daisies, the dandelions, as I was walking once a week to um, one of our um, collection facility sites. So I had to do admission checks during this time and um, you know, getting a greater insight and appreciation. All oh, the dandelions have grown, you know, this tall instead of that tall. And also then reflecting on human impact as well during this time. And um, when we've all been inside, how things have had a chance to establish themselves a lot more, the plants to grow, to interconnect, 
with nature for us to appreciate in a more relaxed form too. And I wondered if, if you got that, because um, I, I heard that you mentioned about mental health as well. So that part of this project must have been good for that as well. Can you oh, I think it was an absolute lifeline to that completely. Um, in, in, and also because it was, you know, like it's about going into those spaces that are so, they're, they're unfamiliar, even though they're local. Because I think about my, my local park, which is literally, you could throw a stone and be there. And I, I, I think I must have been there five times in the eight years that I've lived opposite it, because it, it's just like not somewhere I, I'd, I'd go. And also to meet people there was like really interesting as well. So you see the same people at the same time of day doing exactly the same things like going for a walk, running, because it, it creates a sort of like solid framework in this world where we, we don't feel we have any control because we have a perception of control when, you know, in those days, days prior to that. Um, and I, and I think the, um, I don't know, just like, just that thing of, of collecting plants actually made me think about, you know, sort of like beginning to understand nature, made me think about um, my time in South Africa when I first went there, when, when I met people who knew every single bird and every plant and knew absolutely nothing about what was happening around apartheid. And you just think, but you must have known. But, it, but you, I mean, like you can put things into little boxes, which yeah. I thought, thought was really interesting. And I suppose my picking up on these plants was putting things into a box so I could actually control that part of um, my life at that time and my understanding of the world, um, which, I, I mean, if I took that away, then I, it would all be sort of like a bit at sea. But did it have this time given you an opportunity to, because um, you say, put things in boxes? I've done that part of my, my career as well. But um, now I'm releasing and kind of interconnecting things a lot more from that, taking things out of that box and sort of thinking, that has relevance and connection and impact in this box here. So have you kind of yeah, I think, that through your work? I think through, through to sort of like looking at the, the, the diasporic nature of, all, mm. of the plants I've been choosing and because and like there's you know, quite a lot of pictures in the exhibition but they're like a load more because I, I still I mean I think poor old secret you probably have to drag me away from stop making more pictures writing more words <laughs> <laughs> because I mean like you just keep going and going and going because for me it was like so exciting to do this but I mean like it was um it, it has actually made me think about um, how you can tell the whole world history through plants and, and to talk about why we are where we are and why certain events that went out, why some people um, have more power than other people and, and how those relationships were established many many centuries ago and sort of like that because I, I think with history it's not it's something we live with every single day and it's like a ripple so I think about the invention of the boat the cabal that went from Portugal um, brings us to to where we are today and and, and possibly in this you know, very sensitive site that we're, we're you know where we are in present. Can you tell us a little bit of um, you know, how you engage your, your work with the communities and um, how, how you work in that way? Well, I'm very lucky um, to have the um, opportunity to work with Harrow Club and um, that's with a fantastic group of young people, um, which is quite local to here. Um, and, you know, because of, you know, we, we're all in one very small bubble. Um, but and I was I was expecting quite a lot of resistance because it was all boys in the group and it was like we're going to be doing things on plants and flowers and then like it's going to be really interesting um but they were they were brilliant they completely engaged in it and and we and we did a mixture of um you know looking at plants picking plants making prints and me talking to them about photography and then seeing the magic of um of analog photography, which of course you forget that you know that I'm so old now is sort of like part of me. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but like you know, but, but no, but if you're, if you're seven, eight years old, you know, you've got no idea that if you you know paint something on a bit of paper and then you put something on top of it, that it'll actually make an image. And I remember the first time they saw it, like, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> um, and and um, we were very lucky to also um, get. Um, I spoke to people at Wakehurst, the education team at Wakehurst, and they were really enthusiastic and got engaged and, and sent loads of material 
that we discussed in the groups sort of like to do with biodiversity, um, to do with where plants came from, and, and also sort of like how plants heal us and, um, and how they're our food. And sort of like, and then we all started growing plants as well. So then we, I bought yeah, seeds and things. They started growing things. So we've got a competition thing. going on at the moment. <laughs> like the person who can produce the best plant gets 20 quid. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll be into that. But I think that, that's amazing. And that's the best bit, you know, sort of thinking, oh, they won't be thoroughly interested. And in this era, you know, the, the, the new digital age where everything photography is quite instant and everybody thinks they're the best photographer but to see something it's a bit like that those those young people now growing the seeds and, and um, seeing the plants grow that when they were making those images it was something that they couldn't see originally but then was being developed in the old style of photography because I used to develop my own film as well so I know if I'm old too but, uh, <laughs> but yeah and then probably as a I would like to think that those young people working with you will have a greater appreciation of their surroundings and the plants and how as we were saying earlier how everything still interconnects and it's really important for us all um, to be responsible about how we care for the earth how we nurture and respect one another and things like that so have you had it well apart from the, the plant competition any <laughs> other feedback from these young people of how well, great think, it's supposed to be involved yeah i think well, because the, the last session that we did we did um um prints with using uh, willow so i bought some blown luckily we had a very windy day and i bought so like some willow from the park from the like great big bag of it and we talked about willow and and how it's sort of like um it's like an aspirin and that's where aspirin actually comes from mm -hmm. and so they were very excited about that so but then we made really long prints using um their bodies oh, um wow. with the aspirin to so sort of okay. like talk about how, how plants heal us and how we also commune with the plants. And so we've made these big um, body prints on wallpaper with um, cyanotype. And that was quite magical as well, because they all helped each other to paint mm. the material onto the, the thing and dry it. Yeah, that no, was mm. really, really good. And also to get them to, to work together. So I think that's something maybe they don't do all the time mm. is yeah. to work in a team. So that was really great. I think now we're going to hear from Michael Defoe, the CEO of the Harrow Club. Hi, my name is Michael Defoe. I'm the CEO of the Harrow Clubs. Uh, we run a provision for young people from the age of 8 to 21 years of age and do a variety of youth projects. This summer we had the opportunity to work with Joy on uh, a really interesting project uh, relating to life forces of plants which was um, quite a unique opportunity for our young people to get involved in this fantastic project and work in partnership to uh, create some wonderful pieces of art uh, in, a, in a structured way especially over lockdown and especially during uh, Black Lives Matters. So our young people come from uh, the BME community, the majority of them, and it is very important to engage with these communities, especially in the current climate. Um, I think the young people uh, got a tremendous lot of pleasure of creating art through the way Joy has worked with us and given new ideas on reflection in terms of things that are naturally around you and natural surroundings to um, utilize what you've got so you don't have to have a, a big oozel or big paint brushes or stuff like that you can just use you know nature uh, in its truest form which you know a lot of our members found very uh, fruitful and interesting Michael can you just tell me about the community you work with who they are and, and a little bit about the Harrow Club yeah uh, the young people we work with uh, in W10 are mainly from deprived backgrounds a lot of them are at risk and vulnerable young people and come from the BME community um, we tend to focus on a lot of the young people that are on the breadlines and their families on the breadlines and we provide opportunities and activities to enable them to participate in sport in uh, art in uh, a variety of different um, projects we have a late night project that we run from 10 till 2 p.m for members are out there on the streets or in gangs or maybe want to come away from that we also uh, do programs like debate boxing so we give an opportunity to do some physical exercise but also uh, mental exercise if you like and 
it's really important that we come up with these new ways of working with young people, especially, uh, you know, during lockdown. And in general, uh, you, you know, it's important that we keep on investing in young people. And it's projects like this that enable us to do that. And we're very grateful and thankful that we can work in partnership because it's the only way we're able to provide these unique opportunities for young people in uh, North Kensington. Joy and Miranda, thank you. <laughs> Not a kiss you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining us online. Um, we really do, would encourage you to come down to 236 Westbourne Grove because it's one thing seeing it and experiencing it on a computer screen and it's completely different experiencing it in real life surrounded by the city and the local community. Um, I think it really has shown to me working through this project the kind of complex everyday histories of plants and how they are such an integral part of our lives and also such a, a source of, of healing and solace. Um, but thank you, Joy. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you to Kew Gardens, Wakehurst and to the Harrow Club and to all of you who have attended in person here today um, and online. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>